Genesis chapter number one. Genesis chapter one, please. God blessed them in verse number 28 of the chapter. Prior to that, we find out that we are made in the image of God. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the heavens, livestock, all that creeps. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And then we read a simple sentence, and God blessed them And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, come into our assembly. May this be a super helpful, instructional time in your presence, in your, in your word. Be with all those listening online. Think about Robin Grindstaff, Lord God, and Joyce Reband, and, and those that have just real physical issues. I think about Mary Batie, Father God, who needs a touch from you to get out of Village Green. I think about all those first responders, Lord God, that are serving in the medical field and those that work in nursing homes and those that are in places where the risk is greater and the struggle is more Severe. I pray, oh God, that you would continue to protect us. We're asking, Lord, for special favor. We're asking, Lord, for divine favor. We're asking, God, for a supernatural level of protection that only you can provide. And we're praying, oh God, that you would see fit to continue to be gracious to us as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're looking at the creation mandate today, the creation mandate or cultural mandate. You can find this on Wikipedia. That's how known it is that verse number 28 contains the either creation or cultural mandate. Over the next two weeks, we're going to look at and answer these questions. What is it? What relevance does it have for us? How did the fall of man in chapter 3 impact it? How does it impact the church or does the church, how does the church fit in? And then we really want to focus on what are the implications. We'll look at some of the implications today and next Sunday as well. Divine favor is being poured out by God upon Adam and Eve. This reminds us that being fruitful and having the ability to multiply comes from God. And this is one of the ways that God shows his favor upon mankind, this blessing that he provides. So this week I'm going to call it the creation mandate, that is be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the next week I'm going to call it the cultural mandate, that is subdue it and have dominion over it. And we want to talk about both. So what's a mandate? A mandate is something that's authoritative, it's required, it's expected. This is God communicating to his image bearers, those who he's made, male and female, those who he has created, that he expects those image bearers to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth. So image bearers is to whom this is given to. It's interesting to note that it's given in chapter number one. It's given in again in chapter number nine to Noah and his sons. And then it's given again to to. Israel or Jacob into his sons. And it's also interesting to note that there's actually thousand years between each of these iterations. In other words, God gave it. And a thousand years later, God gave it again to Noah. And then an entire thousand years again, God gave it to Israel or, the, or his people. And what I would suggest to you is that except for Africa, the world has lost sight on this commandment. Let me show it to you. There's a picture on the screen. It's a map. It's a globe. And only, only the areas in Africa is the birth rate outpacing the death rate. Only Africa. Everywhere else in the world, we have a shrinking population because we are not having babies. We're not having babies. We have stopped having babies. We act as though this is not relevant in fact, except for Africa, it's a global problem. 
And oh, by the way, the Christian church has almost lost sight of this completely. But you know who hasn't? The Muslims haven't. The Muslims have not. They are being fruitful and multiplying, and we are not. We are not. We're not concerned. It's as though we forgot that children are a heritage from the Lord. It's as though we forgot that the fruit of the womb is a reward. In fact, you will notice in churches, you will notice this. And shame on us if we're ever like this for even a moment. Shame on us. But you will notice that big families gravitate to small churches in which everyone has a big family. And you know why that is? Because they often get shamed in churches like ours for having so many children. And they'll just be little, little sly comments. Stuff like, how could he afford all those weddings? As though there's some expectation that every single child has to have an elaborate wedding. Or something like this will be said. Wonder how he's going to pay for college for all those kids. We couldn't even put shoes on them if we had that many children. Shame on us, church. Shame on us. As though we've forgotten that children are a blessing from God. If a family chooses to have five, six, seven, that's their choice. You wouldn't want anyone shaming you for having only one, two, or three. So why in the world would you expect to have this privilege of walking around just making sly little comments? And so what you have are these FIC churches. They're called family integrated churches. And they typically homeschool and they have large families. And we shun them. We push them out the door because of how many children they have. We ought to see a church full of children as an incredible blessing from God. We want them running all over everywhere. Just children everywhere. Glory to God for a full nursery. The New Testament is very clear about the expectation of family, taking care of family as much as possible. So my question to you is, without the young, who takes care of the elderly? Without the young, who does it? 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially if he remembers his own household, he's denied the faith and is worse, the King James says, than an infidel. An infidel. 1 Timothy 5, 3 and 4 says, Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. And by the way, that doesn't mean stick them in a nursing home and forget about them. That's not what that means. I'll tell you who gets the best care in a nursing home. It's people who have an advocate on their behalf every single day. That's who gets the best care in a nursing home. It's when you've got a visiting son, a visiting daughter, making sure that somebody's taking care of your mother or your father. Somebody who says, I'm their advocate. I'm working on their behalf. They're not forgotten. Don't stick them in the corner and forget about them. And yet that happens everywhere. Shame on us. I want to talk real this morning. I want to make this relevant. Do you know that the entire Social Security system is built on the premise that we will have lots of people, lots of workers, young people going to work, paying into the system? Facts from their own website. Social Security programs account for nearly a quarter of all federal spending. A quarter of the budget comes from Social Security. Social Security began running deficits in 2010, and its trust fund will be exhausted by 2034. And for those of you that think 2034 is a long way away, it's only 14 years. It's only 14 years. It's right around the corner. It's right around the corner. It's, it's the equivalent of these kindergartners, these kindergartens graduating right about there. It'll be here. We'll blink our eyes, and it'll be here. That's how it works. Social Security has a long-known basic math problem. More money will be going out than coming in. You know in your own household, that doesn't work out very good when more money goes out than what comes in, Okay. Roughly 10,000 baby boomers are retiring each day with insufficient number of younger people entering the workforce to pay the system and support them. Do you know why there's an insufficient number? Because we have stopped having children as a society. That's why we've stopped having children as a society. The, and, we're and we're aborting. We'll get to that soon, brother. 1935, you'll see a triangle there. It has a very large base. 
That's the people in the workforce. It has a very narrow top. That's the people collecting benefits. On the right of that, you'll see a yellow trapezoid. I can't even use a triangle. That's how wide the number of retired, and that's how small the number that are actually working. In fact, the numbers are startling. By 2035, the number of Americans 65 and older will increase from 56 million to 78 million. There are currently only, listen to these numbers, 2.8 workers for every person receiving beneficiaries. Church, that math don't work. Okay? That math don't work. Just do a little count off. One, two, three, you three take care of her in retirement. One, two, three, you take care of her in retirement. You all can realize very quickly, that ain't enough people. That ain't enough people. That's not going to work. By 2035, it'll be 2.3 covered workers. 2.3. Here's the reality. Our God knows that for a society to flourish, it needs many young people maturing into productive adults. Many. It needs many, not a few. It needs many. That's why the first commandment from our God in our Bible is to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. By the way, if you'd like to have another conversation for just a moment, who's going to outfit the fighting force of America 25 years from now? Who's going to fight the next world war? Because the baby boomers, okay, they did their part. They went to war. They came back. They populated. And, and we've decided we don't need it. Robotics? So, Pastor Sean, is there anything in the New Testament that would suggest be fruitful and multiply is no longer applicable? In other words, are we dealing with an Old Testament commandment that the New Testament has set aside in some way? Well, the closest thing I found to anything remotely like that is when Paul says that he wishes that some were like him, unmarried and single. But let, let me remind you that those people who choose that singleness are dedicating their lives to Christ. It's not singleness to make more money. It's not singleness to have power or a lifestyle choice. It's so that I can serve the kingdom of God better. But apart from that, Paul says to everyone else that's burning, get married, get married. That's what Paul says. So certainly childless to serve Christ more is a serious conversation to be had, one that we should respect in the body of Christ. But that same Holy Spirit led the same Paul to write this. In 1 Timothy 5, 14, he says, So I would have the younger widows to marry, bear children, and manage their households. And I know you can't even say that today. The feminists are ready to arrest you when you read a Bible verse like that. How sexist. What a bigoted bigot, bigot you are. Unbelievable that you would suggest that women have children. Shame on you. You explain to me how we're going to solve some of our societal problems without children. You explain to me how we're going to fix some of the problems that we have without children. You do understand that Japan is an example of a growing global problem in which there aren't young people to take care of the older people in nursing homes. Study it. Be aware of what's happening in the globe. Learn from what's happening in other societies and recognize we have problems. The world's perspective goes something like this. The argument that having more children is good for society is a little bit trickier. So shame on you, Pastor Sean, for suggesting that more children is good for society. Shame on you. Some environmentalists argue that the population control is the key to protecting the Earth's resources. You know, we'll protect it to the point that we're not even here anymore. Then you can just enjoy the Earth. There'll be plenty of fresh water for you. Others say a childless society might be preferable to the life of a parent. And glory to God, there's been a day like that for in my life, and then I repent. You know, we've all had those moments, okay? Some philosophers even argue that it's immoral to have children. Immoral. So I would say to you, if there was ever a time when it was questionable to bring children into the world, it was during the Babylonian captivity. 
Do you remember the Babylonian captivity? That's when Israel was taken captive. They were no longer living in their own city. They were no longer living in their own country. They were slaves of the Babylonian empire, living like that. And yet the word of the Lord goes from the prophet Jeremiah to them. Turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. And I want you to see that even during a captivity, God had an expectation for his people. Even when they were living as exiles in a foreign country under a foreign king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, God still had an expectation for his people. Verse number one says, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles. The letter went to the priests and the prophets and all the people, the people that Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And then we get all kinds of specifics as to who was taken, who was in charge. And then in verse number four, we read these words. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles from whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Listen to these instructions. Build houses. Live in them. Plant gardens. Eat produce. And then look at the very next thing that's stated. Take wives Have sons and daughters. Take wives for the sons and daughters you just had. Give your daughters in marriage. Why? That they too may have sons and daughters. And then we read these words from our God, church. Listen to them so well. Multiply there and do not decrease. Do not decrease. Don't let yourself shrink. Don't let the population of God's people shrink. Multiply there. Multiply there. So here we have our God giving us incredible instructions, and we're going to look at it again next week just to give you a little teaser. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Boy, that's good instruction right there. You can just read that and understand. I'm in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and the Word of God tells those exiles in that day to seek the welfare of the city. And here I am, like an exile, a Christian exile, living in a foreign country, because this is not my home. My citizenship is in heaven, and yet I'm told to seek the welfare of the city where I've been sent into exile. And next week, we're going to unpack that because I see it as so relevant to the cultural mandate, so relevant. So even during such difficult times of exile, God gives them a word concerning this matter of creating and multiplying and having babies. So I'm gonna give you four implications, four implications of the commandment or the mandate Be fruitful and multiply. So what I'm really trying to do this morning is I'm trying to make this message as relevant to the year 2020 as possible. I want want you to see how relevant it is. So implication number one, we the church, we the church, we the people of God, we the Christians, we the disciples of Christ, we the followers of the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ, must be Uber pro straight marriage. And I'm talking about obnoxiously uber pro straight marriage. Now, listen to me very clearly. It doesn't mean that we're nasty. It doesn't mean that we're rude. It doesn't mean that we don't have compassion. It doesn't mean that we're not civil. It doesn't mean that I have to be obnoxious. It doesn't mean that I have to be rude, but I'm not going to cave. I'm not going to cave. I'm not taking steps back when I'm pushed upon. If they push, I'll gently push back. We can have a conversation that's civil. We can have a conversation that's appropriate. I am not expected, I learned this from um, from Autumn, to zip it and then, what was it, lock it and pocket it. 
How, did I do that right? Where's the, is that? Yeah, okay. Zip it, lock it, and put it in your pocket. That's what I learned that she learned in preschool. I'm paying a lot of money to learn that. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> I hope they're learning more, okay? Let, let's, I know it's worth it. I know. Thank you, sister. All right, I said that silly thing for this reason. The unsaved world expects us as Christians to zip it, lock it, and pocket it. We're, we're, we're expected to keep our opinion to ourselves. They're allowed to put theirs on public policy. They're allowed to put theirs on Facebook. They're allowed to put theirs on Instagram. They're allowed to tweet about their position. But they expect us to zip it, lock it, and stick it in our pocket. And we are caving. We are collapsing. We are retreating. They're advancing and we're pulling back. They're advancing and we're pulling back. It is as though we are the minority and we just keep stepping back, stepping back. You say, Pastor Son, why in the world do we have to be pro-straight marriage? Why? Why can't we just kind of whatever you want? Thank you, brother. Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. The implication is clear. This traditional family, this is President Obama. This is his wife. And, and, and this is the, the father and mother of those two girls. That is the traditional family right there. Okay? They, they became one flesh and had one child. They became one flesh and had two children. And you know what they did? They stayed married. They provided an example of what the traditional family looks like. And sociologists are writing about the death of the traditional family church. The death of it. And there are some that are even celebrating the death of the traditional family. Celebrating it. Hear me well. When the traditional family dies, America dies. It's a slow death. It's a slow, painful, agonizing death. Never before have we seen the church compromising on marriage, family, and sexuality like it is today. At the early service, I had a man come up to me an elderly man. And he said, for 35 years I've been part of the United Methodist Church, but this morning I decided I'm leaving that church. It has thrown the towel in on marriage, family, and sexuality. We as a church are collapsing. We as a church are retreating. Who's going to hold the line if we don't? The world wants us silenced. They don't even want us meeting. Do you know another number of people that think that our assembly this morning right now is absolutely unethical? Yet the commandment to be fruitful and multiply demands that we hold to biological sex equals gender. No compromising. Biological sex equals gender. And for all you ladies, all you young women in this audience who like athletics, you play volleyball, you run cross country, you run sports, you want more preachers like me preaching about biological sex equals gender because there are transgender men that are ready to take over your sport. The entire church has its head in the sand and we need to reach down and pull our heads out of the sand and look what's happening. And if there was ever a movement that should be having fits with what's happening, it's the feminist movement. And the feminist movement is throwing the towel in as transgender men are dominating women's sports. And we're not even paying attention. We're just oblivious. Well, I can't be oblivious 
God calls me to be a preacher in 2020 and to make the message relevant to what's happening in our world. You know why they put John the Baptist in prison? Because he was preaching against sin. We hold to our views because of Genesis 2.24, in which Jesus said that God said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The gender specificity in this text is unreal. The man opposed to the wife. The father and mother, the only two genders that can produce a child. It is called his wife, not their wife, by the way. He doesn't pick a gender-neutral term right there. It's called his wife. Do you know why it's called his wife? Because he is a his. I know. Can you believe that the preacher has to explain in the year 2020 that he is a his and that she is a her? Our Bible gives no room for gender fluidity. None. There's no room for it. The wife is the woman the man is marrying. So what do we see in Genesis 2.24? Number one, we see that children are expected to grow up. That children are expected to grow up. That they are to mature and they are to leave the house. Tell it like this. We didn't build that bonus room for you. Let them know. The basement ain't for you. There's a clear biblical expectation that they grow up, that they leave mother and father. And I know it's sad, mamas. I know it's pitiful, but it's biblical. It's biblical. Number two, men court women, not video games, Men court women. Men court women. You have to take a chance. You have to be willing to get your feelings hurt. Somebody might say no. It's one of the reasons why men aren't courting. Because they're afraid of loss. They're afraid of failure. What if she says no? Move on. How do you find a wife if you're not courting? Number three, they don't live together in sin. Let me say it like this. They don't shack up. They get married. They get married. They enter into a covenant relationship with each other. They make promises of commitment. I'm going to love you sick until the end. I'm going to do it through and through. They do it the right way. And number four, perhaps God blesses and the one flesh union brings children. So my... My thought is, with what our Bible says, it is inconceivable to me how the church got to the place where it's at today. And what you have to conclude is that the church got here because it abandoned God's word. It abandoned God's word. It no longer preaches God's word. It doesn't read it. And it certainly doesn't follow it. When you don't let me preach it, I quit. It's that simple. This book has to be our standard for life. And the New Testament is just as specific. If you read Romans 7, 2 with gender fluidity, you are absolutely confused beyond measure. The married woman is bound by the law until her husband. It's as specific as it gets. Her husband dies, she is released. Even the Hallmark Channel's thrown in the towel recently, church. 
There's no place you can go in which that movement is not seeking to make inroads. The church, media, the public school system, everywhere. Everywhere. Look at the political platforms of the politicians today. Look at it. Study it. Romans 13, 4 says, Let marriage be held in honor above all. Let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. You wonder why everything's going wrong in your life? You wonder why you're not being blessed by God? Start following God's plan. We have young people and old people who want God's blessing without following God's plan. God blesses those who follow his plan. 14 ideas about honoring marriage. Number one, men need to be mentored. Men need to be mentored. Mentor the man. Mentor the man to become a man. Number two, teach and train the young women. Teach and train the young women. Number three, celebrate legitimate courtship. Go crazy about legitimate courtship. Number four, congratulate the engaged couple. Congratulate them. Celebrate it. Announce it to the whole world. Show the church that there are young people doing it the right way. Number five, attend the wedding shower. Attend it. I know you're busy. I know your life is busy. But make time to attend the wedding shower. Make time. Husbands, watch the children so your wife can go to the wedding shower. Say to her, I'll watch the children so that you can go celebrate that wedding shower. Number six, buy a needed gift. Buy one. We can't afford it. Go in with two people. Go in with three people. Share it amongst yourselves. The point of the matter is you're saying, we believe in your marriage. We believe in what's happening. Number seven, attend the wedding. Congratulate the couple. Number eight, continue to coach the newlyweds. Continue to coach not so newlyweds. In other words, we want to do all we can to minimize divorce in the church. Get involved in each other's lives. Help us make it through the tough times. Number nine, celebrate the conception of a child. When they get a child, go crazy about it. Number 10, attend the baby shower. Number 11, buy them diapers. They're going to need them. Number 12, congratulate the couple on the birth. Number 13, get involved in helping raise the children, the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Get involved. You say to yourself, I'm going to do something with my 8-year-old. And then you realize there's another 8-year-old in the church whose dad is not involved in their life. Take that 8-year-old with you. Do all you can to help. Do all you can. There's single parents in our church. There are single moms in our church. They are having a tough time going at it. You're going to take your kid to the ball game? Take their boys with her to the ball game. we got to do everything we can to get males involved in the lives of these boys. Everything we can. Men, you ought to work Awana just for the fact of having a male influence in Awana. Sunday school should not be dominated by females. We need more males teaching children Sunday school. Why? Because boys need males influence. It's necessary. It's absolutely critically. It's not a slam on ladies in any way, shape, and form. In fact, any mama worth her salt knows her boys need male influence. And number 14, we got to make disciples. We got to make disciples so that the cycle can start all over again. Implication number two. So implication number one is that we are going to be uber pro straight marriage. Uber pro straight marriage. Number two is we have to be pro-traditional family. We must be pro-traditional family. Pro. And so you say, Pastor Sean, but our life is a wreck. Then get it as close back to traditional family as you can. Okay, I know the sin is present. I know divorce happens. I got it. I was a factor of divorce. Those of you who know my childhood, it was a mess. If there was a word to describe it, it was dysfunctional. So do everything you can to get it as close to functional as possible. If you're on your second marriage, make that your last marriage. Why? Well, number one, because it's God's will. Right off the bat, because God said it. God said this is how it's supposed to be. 
Father, mother, children. One, one, and children. That's how God said it. Number two, because children do better in the traditional family. I don't need to show you slide after slide of the statistics, but every measurable metric, children do better in a traditional family. Whether it be education, whether it be jobs, it doesn't matter. All the metrics show that. That doesn't mean that if you're a single mom today that your life isn't wrecking your children are going to jail. No, the church is going to rally around you and help make up for what the fall of man created. But we can't rally around you if you're not here. When it comes to sexuality and marriage and family, the Bible prohibits a Christian from being progressive. It's not an option. It's not an option. You can't be progressive and be a biblicist. You can't. You can't have it both ways. You can't have this worldview on Sundays, but on Tuesday you vote for progressives. You can't. The Bible doesn't let you. The Bible demands. The Bible insists. The Word of God gives us no room for progressive ideals on these areas. This is why I cannot support a progressive politician. I cannot. The world we're living in is where we just stick our head in the sand and don't investigate the policies that they stand for. We are, listen to me very closely, we are more concerned with the personality of the candidate than the platform that they stand for. Amen. I like the way he looks. I don't like the way he talks. I think he'd be nicer. I'd rather I go out to dinner with him versus him. That's not how we support candidates. We look at their policies. We look at what their platform is. We have a platform. It's called the Word of God. And what we want to know is how do you line up with what we know to be true? Do you understand that the progressives want us silenced? Do you understand that Facebook is taking all kinds of heat for letting us put our opinion on Facebook? Do you understand that our opinion is to be silenced while their opinion is to be exalted? Here's the reality. Listen to me very closely. We have no idea to what degree Google is manipulating the data. We have no idea because Google decides what you see when you search for something. You don't get a pick. You search for something and then the algorithms run their course and then the top things come up. Do you understand how much control you have when you can manipulate the search engines? I don't, I, don't think, I don't think we realize it. I don't think we're thinking about it. I think you're even surprised that the preacher's talking about it. That you want a nice little sermonette to tickle our stuff and then go out about our week. But the problem is the Bible doesn't let us do that. The prophets of God have been called to confront the societal issues from the beginning of time. You know what they called Noah? He was called by Peter a preacher of righteousness. You know what the implication is? That there's unrighteous stuff. Right. See and understand God's plan. See the man leaving his father and his mother. See the man leaving the family he was raised in. See the man getting married to start his own family. 
understand that the two remain married and raise their children such that God gave them in such a way that their sin be, son becomes a man and that he leaves his father and mother and the daughter leaves their father and mother to look for a man and to start the family all over again. We have abandoned God's plan. This plan whereby children obey their parents, this plan by wives nurture, comfort, and teach their children, this plan whereby husbands act as the protector and the pastor and the provider of this family, this plan whereby Christ is the head of the church and he's the head of the husband, this plan has been abandoned by the evangelical church. We've abandoned God's plan and are frustrated with the results we're getting. You say, but Pastor Sean, I'm a single parent. Pastor Sean, I've, I've already divorced. What do I do now? You get back to what right looks like as God permits. Pray about it. Pray about it. I've seen husbands step up in here and say, I'm going to marry her and be the father to somebody else's children. I've seen that, and they're saying, somebody's going to stand in the gap, and it's going to be me. So answering the critics. Pastor Sean, you're making way too much of one Old Testament verse. Am I really? This is the verse that Jesus went to when they confronted him on sin. Divorce, family. This is the verse that Paul quotes twice. Check out how many times Paul quotes any verse twice. And he quotes this one twice. Implication number three. So number one was that we're going to be pro-straight marriage. Number two is we're going to be pro-traditional family. And number three is we must be pro-life. We must. It's not an option. It's not a choice for me. The Bible demands that as a Christian, I must be pro-life. It's not optional. In fact, let me say it like this, just so you're clear. Any Christian or preacher or Sunday school teacher or deacon or elder, disciple of Christ, who isn't pro-life is a hypocrite. Yeah, I said it. Come talk to me afterwards. Let's have a legitimate conversation about how you can say I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and his word and I'm not pro-life. You can't. You simply can't. The number on the screen is 50 million. 50 million. Just so you get a perspective on 50 million It's the equivalent of taking every single person in the state of California and Ohio and combining them. That's 50 million. The entire state of California and Ohio, put them together, and that's 50 million. And that 50 million represents the low number of the number of abortions since 1973. We as a United States, not globally, this is the United States, And this is the conservative number. Do a fact check on me. Do a fact check because I did my own fact check before I put something up there because I don't want to be embarrassed. So I do my own fact check. Multiple sources. 50 million. If you were born in 1973, you'd be 47 years old, 48 years old. Somewhere around there. That means for 30 years... 30 years, you'd been contributing to society as an adult. During those 30 years, you know what you would have probably had? Children. Let's go back to the Social Security equation for just a moment. There are 178 million employees paying into the system to fund 65 million beneficiaries. That's where that three-to-one ratio goes. But what if you added 50 million plus their children to the equation? What if we hadn't aborted them? What if we'd had them instead? What if they'd went to school and got jobs and were paying into the Social Security? 
Instead of having a one to three or a one to two eight ratio, you'd have more of a one to three nine or a one to four one ratio. That's a lot better than one to two. My point to you is there are implications for the choices we are making. We are reaping what we've been sowing as a society. But let's be clear. Pro-life is not limited to just the unborn. It means that I'm in favor of school vouchers. Wait a minute, whoa, 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 how did you get to school vouchers? That was a giant leap. Wait a minute, I'm pro-life. I'm pro-life. I'm pro-life before they're born, and I'm pro-life after they're born. And I want to make sure that that underprivileged kid who is born to a single mom who in a, in, a, in a messed up neighborhood and has no chance to go to anything but one public school gets a chance for something different. I want to make sure that they have an opportunity to go to a better school. I don't want my taxpaying dollars regulating their future by determining what school they go to because their school's in a poor neighborhood. In other words, what I'm suggesting to you this morning is that our worldview determined by the Bible has huge implications in public policy. I'm in favor of food banks. I'm in favor of justice for all. I want to know what the politicians are going to do to stop the murders in Chicago and Baltimore and Flint and Detroit. I'm pro-life. I'm pro-life before they're born and I'm pro-life after they're born. I'm concerned for justice for all. I want affordable health care. We need to figure this out. We need to figure this out. I don't know what that looks like, but we have elected all these politicians to Washington, D.C. to figure these problems out. And instead of figuring out problems, they name call all day long. We have huge problems. What I know right now is that the pharmacies are making money hand over fist on our taxpaying dollars. Go buy prescription drugs. Before my Opa passed away in the late 90s, my Oma was real bad. Dementia, all the medications. And my Opa would say to me on the phone, Sean, I'm paying my life savings to the pharmaceutical industry. I'm giving away my life savings to pay for prescription drugs. Because you know every old person's on three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. One more medication is the solution for every single problem. And who's making money on that? Somebody is. I don't have the solution, but I know there's a necessity for affordable health care if I'm going to be pro life. My point to you is this. It's not just one issue. It's a holistic approach that's necessary. And number four, and we're done. I have to be pro-pregnancy. I have to be. I have to be. And this demands, this demands, this understanding that the commandment to be fruitful and multiply is necessary and applicable, this understanding that all life is a gift from God regardless of the cause of conception. All life. Doesn't matter what the conception was. I'm talking about whether there's two teenagers who shacked up for a moment. That's still a gift from God in that womb. And we as a church are not going to shame that mom into where she doesn't still get the family of the church. Why? Because we are pro life. And pro life requires that we're pro what? Pregnancy. And so this means that I. As a conservative, still support the best prenatal and postnatal care programs our society can provide. So what about the public policy implications and is all this relevant? On the screen, I have a picture of a Catholic church. 
And don't, don't criticize me for talking about the Catholic Church because I was baptized in a Roman Catholic Church. My parents were married in a Roman Catholic Church. My grandparents were German Roman Catholics, faithful as can be, mass and all that. But this is what I saw and this is what I heard. Hear me well. I disagree with the church. 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 In fact, I never heard them agree with the church. I wasn't sure why they were Roman Catholics because every single time a church issue came up, they openly would say, I disagree with the church. I disagree with the church. Disagree with the Pope. Disagree with the bishop on that. Disagree with the cardinal on that. Disagree, 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 disagree. And here's my thought. Protestants have become like Catholics. They disagree with the church. They disagree with the church. They disagree with the preacher. They disagree with the Bible. They disagree. They disagree. They disagree. And they prove it every time they vote. And they prove it every single time they vote. Hear me well. Pay attention. The media wants to distract you from the policy debate and focus you on the personalities of the candidates to the point where you forget that there's actually policy decisions that are critical. So they keep putting pictures and snapshots and communicating this and that. But when was the last time you legitimately heard about a platform? When was the last time you heard about a policy decision? When was the last time a legitimate de debate was being had concerning this versus that? It's boiled down to name calling. And it is a distraction. And it's distracting the church as well as the unsaved world. We cannot be hypocrites, church. Our Bible demands that we have particular positions in life. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, help us, oh God, to be faithful followers of Christ every day of our life, seven days a week. Help us not to abandon our Christian faith when push comes to shove in debates and conversations and perspectives. Give us, O oh God, the grace and the strength to be the salt and the light that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.